Uh, Patrick, absolutely wonderful to see you in real life. We've had a number of conversations we've done online o over this COVID period on uh, his last book, which brought down the Sackler dynasty, but m perhaps more of that at some other time. This latest book that uh, uh, Patrick is going to be launching when in a couple of months or a uh, few few weeks in um, in June in the states and um, and uh, July I think in the UK. Uh, again, it's really about his fascination with baddies from across the world. So I'm going to start by Patrick. Why so? What's the fascination with all of these baddies that you sort of go after them and and still live to live to tell the tale? I mean, you said no to Pablo. Escobar uh, about writing his uh, his memoir. Uh, yeah, well, I, I should say first of all, Sandra, it's wonderful to be here with you in person. I, this is one of these. Uh, I think probably many of us have had this experience of these friendships that you make entirely virtually uh, in the context of the pandemic, only to eventually meet people um, in the flesh. And so it's wonderful to be here uh, with you and with all of you. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny, I, so I write for The New Yorker magazine, and I, um, I guess I'm an investigative journalist, but I try to tell these kind of big sweeping narrative stories about people. Um, and part of what I love about the job is that you, you, I'm a bit of a professional dilettante. I don't have a, um, a particular area of specialty. As you said, my last book was about the Sackler family, the book before that was about the Troubles in Northern Ireland. Uh, and I like to sort of magpie from one subject to another. What was strange about putting together this collection is that in the moment when you're writing one piece or deciding what the next one will be, you just sort of feel as though you follow your gut and um, you sort of follow the winds where they take you and that there's no real connection from one story to the next. But of course, in retrospect, for me, sitting down and picking 12 pieces that I'd written from the last 15 years, and the 12 that are really my favorite, I realize all of these threads, all of these connections between them. And one of them, yes, is uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm interested in roguish people. I'm interested in people behaving badly. Um, and I guess more specifically, um, I'm very intrigued by the idea that a lot of the time, you know, there's, there's an old adage in screenwriting in Hollywood that, the, that the, the villain in the movie never thinks that he's the villain in the movie. He actually thinks he's the hero of the movie. He's in a whole different movie than the one you're watching. Um, and that, to me, is, a, is an illuminating idea because I think often what I'm interested in is not just, um, say, Chapo Guzman, the head of the Sinaloa cartel, uh, or a family like the Sacklers, um, or Mark Burnett, whose story I tell, who's the man who kind of invented reality TV as we know it. He created the show Survivor and then The Apprentice and helped launch Donald Trump onto the national and international stage. These people tend not to think of themselves as villains. They have a different story that they tell themselves, and I'm interested in, in those questions of, you know, what is the narrative that they present to their family, to their friends, to themselves in the mirror when they get up in the morning? And is the long form story, because all your stories in The New Yorker is long form or, or what today will be seen as long form, is there still a space for that, especially in our today's social media world? Because typically each of your stories are what, at least 3,000 words. Oh, at least, I mean, often uh, 10,000 or more, yeah. I mean, the <laughs> long form. The, um, I always say, you know, if, if you think it took you a long time to read it, imagine how long it took me to write it. Um, the, it, it. I have to be careful with this because I think there may be some of you out there who have New Yorker subscriptions and the, you know, people often tell me that the, they, they sort of, they love the magazine but they resent it. Um, because it does keep coming every week and it's just hard to get through it and it piles up on your bedside table like an accusation. Um, uh, so yeah, listen, I, I love that form. I think it might be the perfect form for nonfiction writing and I say that as somebody who's, who's written books and loves doing so. Um, but for me, the idea of a piece that you can sit down and it might take you 45 minutes to read, and you're in and out of it in that amount of time, in a sitting. And you can immerse yourself, and there are characters you feel you get to know, but it's not that much of a commitment. You can read it, you know, uh, 
as you get into bed after a couple of glasses of wine before you fall asleep. Um, and there was an interesting moment, I think, at The New Yorker where we, when people started shifting to their phones, to reading things on screens and, and reading things on phones, there was a fear that they wouldn't read these longer pieces, that everything would compress. And it was a big surprise, I think, to us, and a welcome one, that people would read a 12,000-word article on their phone. That we can, And we can log this. We see the stats, and somebody will sit and spend an hour, an hour and a half, slowly scrolling through a really long piece like that. Um, so I think there's an appetite for it. The more difficult challenge um, is that the kind of work that I do is very, very resource-intensive. And there just aren't a lot of places that will give you the time. I'll spend six months, eight months, a year sometimes working on a story. And um, I mean, there's a story I tell in the book about this guy, Benny Steinmetz, who at different times has been the wealthiest man in Israel. He's a, um, he's a very bad man. And um, a, uh, a, a diamond magnate who was very involved in uh, West Africa. And there was a, a corrupt deal for a very prized mineral asset in, the, in Guinea, which is one of the poorest countries in the world. And Benny I, Iron, I mean, this was yes, primarily iron, iron, iron ore. ore. And um, Benny Steinmetz is this kind of, he's like, a, he's like the villain in a James Bond movie. He sort of, you know, he kind of moves around the world on his private jet. He's sort of everywhere and nowhere, very difficult to pin down, never gave interviews. And um, I finally persuaded him to talk to me, I thought and flew to London because they told me to fly to London. And when I got to London, they said, oh, you know, it's unfortunate, he's just left for Paris. And so I quickly took the train to Paris. But by the time I got there, they said, oh, he, you've lost him again. He went to Israel. And I had to call my editor and say, can I, on the spur of the moment, can I fly to Israel? And he said, well, do you have a guarantee that he's going to be there? And I said, well, I don't know. I might show up in Israel only to be told that he's flown to West Africa. Um, and so at that point I had to come back, but I then came back and eventually did meet him in Cap d'Antibes. And that was a piece where I spent 10 months and they sent me all over the world and hiring fixers and interpreters and so forth. And that, that is something that I think is, um, is a little bit in jeopardy, that kind of reporting. What is amazing is, of course, you know, the, the obvious bad guys, the El Chapos or, or Steiner, etc. Those, those are obvious. You know they're bad guys. You know they've been doing horrible, horrible things. But yet your first story in the book is about wine fraud, red wine fraud. Tell us a little bit about how you stumbled upon this particular story. And I think everybody here loves red wine. And when they, when they try and buy a bottle at the auction, what they need to be careful about. Yeah, this is, this is probably the most fun I've ever had as a journalist. Um, back in 2007, a friend of mine uh, who loves wine, as I do, sent me a note and he said, you have to write a story about counterfeit wine. And I thought, counterfeit wine, what even is that? Uh, what, a, what a concept. And what I learned was that um, over the last 20 or 30 years, you had a lot of very wealthy people, um, particularly in North America and in Asia, who had acquired vast fortunes quickly and wanted to build big, first-rate wine cellars. And so they would buy thousands, tens of thousands of bottles of wine and create these great cellars of the, the, from the classic, uh, the classic vineyards in France, particularly. And what they didn't realize is that at a certain point there were these very brilliant, unscrupulous players who went into business creating counterfeits. And so there are different types of counterfeits. Sometimes it would be... Um, a, a, a wine that wasn't what it claimed to be, you know, a bottle of Lafitte that wasn't really Lafitte. Sometimes it would be uh, the actual wine, but they changed the year. So, you know, you take a, a 1985 Petrus um, and sort of redecorate it so that it looks like a 1982, which is worth more. And this was all, uh, in some ways, kind of the perfect crime because the theory was, first of all, some of these people are collecting so much wine that they're, it's going to be a lifetime before they drink it all. So they may not even open the bottle for years. And when they do, if they discover that something's off, uh, 
there is, as you all know, a great deal of variety in any given case of wine and you know every one out of every 20 or so bottles is is going to be off anyway and so at that point who's to say um but then the really brilliant thing and this is where the fun of this story was for me is that there's also the idea that you know people might just happily enjoy the fake because they can't taste the difference and if that's the case isn't it a victimless crime there's a great story that a, a guy told me who was the wine director of a very fancy restaurant in uh las vegas and it actually was about an 82 Petrus. And he said, um, he said that there were some investment bankers who'd come in from New York and they'd just concluded a big deal and they were celebrating. And they were feeling expansive and so they ordered a bottle of 82 Petrus, um, which as I recall, it was something like six or seven thousand dollars a bottle. Yeah, six thousand dollars a bottle. Um, and I think there were three of them and they, they drank it, it was fantastic. And so they liked it so much that they ordered a second one. So the wine director brought out very ceremoniously a second bottle and decants it and presents it and they taste it and it tastes off. There's something wrong with it. They don't know quite what, but they return it. Um, and you can imagine that at the restaurant, having a $6,000 bottle of wine opened and then returned is, is uh, you know, not necessarily a, um, a welcome turn of events, but they very apologetically brought out a third bottle. And this one tasted fine. The bankers enjoyed it. And afterwards, they were doing a post-mortem uh, in the kitchen at the restaurant. They had the three bottles, and they figured out the problem with the second one. It was genuine. <laughs> and I did find that, that this is this, this thing that comes up again and again, is that you have uh, people who, in theory, should know. I mean, there's a story I tell about a much earlier Petrus, I don't remember when it was, but it was a, um, it was literally something like 1924. Um, there was a Magnum that Robert Parker tasted. And Robert Parker, you know, one of the most famous- The god, god, of, god of wine tasting. The god of wine Critic. tasting. Critic. Insured his own nose for a million dollars. Uh, nobody is as discerning as Robert Parker. Notes on every wine you can possibly imagine. And he had gone to, a big event, a wine event, that was organized by a man who's a, one of the rogues in my story, this guy Hardy Rodenstock, who was one of these counterfeiters. And he gave it a great review to this magnum of, again, I believe it was 24 Petrus. Um, it's 100 points, he said, it's out of this world, I've never tasted anything like it. So it turns out that um, in 1924, Petrus didn't make any magnums, they didn't bottle any magnums. So when I was working on the article, I called Robert Parker and I said, you know, Mr. Parker, what were you drinking? What, what did you, what was out of this world? What did you give a hundred points? And he was very quick. I thought this was a very sly answer. What he said was, he, he wouldn't take back his own sort of tasting appraisal, right? He said, I don't know what that was. It was every bit as good as I said it was. And if that was a fake, then the guy who made it should be making wine. He should be a mixer because it was so terrific. So that was a fun piece for me because it's, it's, it is the kind of question I think we all wonder about the emperor's new clothes. But what is amazing is this particular rogue, so to speak, who's counterfeiting all of this wine, didn't get into mixing. And obviously he understood wine to a large extent. But even as you started discovering the fraud that went back and back and back and the amount that he had done. So he had, he had a talent, right? And what in your mind was that psychological issue that he had that he decided not to do the legitimate wine tasting or wine mixing because he was obviously a great wine mixer, but instead got into wine forgery, including changing the inscription on the bottle, rubbing out the last uh, uh, number on the cork, uh, etc. I, th I think there's probably a couple of answers. I mean, one, and this is, this is an idea that threads through a lot of these stories, is, the, is people pushing, is that the, the profit margins in, uh, in creating fake wine were considerably better than they would have been even for a really successful mixer. Um, I think he was a sort of a, not necessarily a one-man operation, but I mean, he was, he was, he was doing this on a small enough scale 
but with bottles that were that would sell for enough at auction uh, that he could he could maintain a pretty good living doing this. Um, I mean, the story that I tell in the in the in the piece is about these bottles of wine that that were said to have belonged to Thomas Jefferson, and they sold for about a hundred thousand dollars each at auction, um, and they had. Um, they had the name of the vineyard actually etched into the, the glass of the bottle in the year 1787, and the initials THJ, and they were auctioned With the dot as opposed to the colon. Exactly, yeah. R written in a way that, that Jefferson didn't, it was sort of close to the way Jefferson used to write his initials, but not exactly the same way. Um, and so, and, and what the, the story is about is that he, he basically, he sells these bottles to various collectors and then one of the collectors is this guy, Bill Koch, and you've heard of the Koch brothers in the States who are in, involved in uh, uh, funding various political activity. So this is another of the Koch brothers, this is Bill Koch, but he's not one of the political ones. Bill Koch spent his great fortune on, um, on art and wine. So he's the youngest of the three brothers, but outside of the Republican Party. Yeah, I mean, I think probably in the Republican Party, but not, a, but not an active, not somebody who's, who's um, actively... Looking for regime change. You know? <laughs> exactly. The, um, and so he spent all his money on, um, on, uh, on art and wine, and, and at a certain point, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston was going to do a retrospective of his collections. And he has an unbelievable art collection. I mean, I went to his, his home in, um, in Florida, and just incredible, incredible um, paintings on every surface. And so the Museum of Fine Arts was going to show these, and then they decided they would also show some of his Jefferson bottles. He said, oh, of course, you have to include my Jefferson bottles. They belong to Thomas Jefferson. And the museum said, well, of course, we would love to, but before we do the show, we would need to see some provenance um, indicating that they really did belong to Thomas Jefferson. And they called Monticello, which is the, where Jefferson had lived, and there's a center devoted to the study of Jefferson. And Monticello came back and said, we don't think those ever belonged to Thomas Jefferson. Those wines that I think he spent half a million dollars on, on four bottles of wine. So Bill Koch is a very litigious guy who, he's the kind of person who has like ex-FBI agents on the payroll. And um, he um, and he's very into cowboy culture, primarily suing his brothers as well. Just yeah, he's for the he's he's just famous for for uh, for litigation. He loves litigation. Um, he, he would to me he would always talk about yeah we dropped a subpoena on him. I said it's the way you would talk about you know dropping a grenade on someone. But um, and so Bill Koch goes after this guy Hardy Rodenstock to try and show him up as a fraud. But I was going to say I don't think it's just the money. I think there's also with some of these fraudsters. I think they like flying as close to the sun as they can. I think there's a thrill. I think there's an excitement with, with being so clever that you, that you pull it off, that you get away with it. Um, and I think that's true with, with, uh, with a number of these people that I, I tell these stories about, is that there's a kind of, even Chapo Guzman, I mean, um, Chapo Guzman was a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant guy. An awful guy somebody who's responsible for thousands of murders, just untold death and misery. But um, this is the guy who invented the idea of digging a tunnel under the US-Mexico border. Um, and you know, today, the, the, the ground beneath the border that runs between the US and Mexico is like Swiss cheese. I mean, everybody's digging tunnels. And this is the person who first had the idea, the kind of eureka moment. What if we have all these authorities trying to stop us from sending drugs from one side of the border to the other? So what if we just dug a tunnel underneath? Um, I, I think that there's a kind of excitement and a thrill for some of these people in, in living on the other side of the law. Before we move on to the next story, I just for all of us wine lovers, tell us what you discovered. What is it that we need to look out for when, when we're looking at a, a bottle It's not quite what it's supposed to be? I mean, I honestly, it's, I, I don't think you can protect yourselves. I don't. Because there are certain things. So for instance, you can look at the cork. Um, and if, certainly if you see the last, if you see the year on the cork scratched out, um, that's generally a sign that somebody's, somebody's pulling your leg. But often, um, the, the, you know, if you, if you do have old, very valuable bottles, you can actually, the, the vineyard offers a recorking service sometimes because the cork itself can, can rot or age, and so you can bring them in. So even a kind of a newer cork or capsule on an old bottle doesn't necessarily tell you. Listen, I had, <laughs> I had these amazing experiences. After that piece came out, uh, 
we had the New Yorker Festival, which is a little bit like this, um, but in grubby New York City. Um, and every year in the fall, we have a whole series of conversations like this. And I did a panel on counterfeit wine. And I invited Bill Koch and a prosecutor who had prosecuted some of these fraudsters, and then a couple of these wine detectives. And these are people who are, whose whole job it is to advise and go into your cellar and tell you what's real and what's fake. And they do very well with this be, for precisely the reason you're asking. People want to protect themselves. How can we, what can we look out for? So we had this wonderful panel. But then Bill Koch had said, listen, if, if I'm going to be in town afterwards, why don't we all have dinner? This is this incredible meal um, that we all had afterwards. He, he brought his own beef. This is the kind of thing Bill Koch does, is he, had, he has these special Wagyu cows that he breeds and, um, at some ranch in Wyoming or something. And so he said, I'm going to bring my own beef to town. And then we, he had to call around and find a restaurant that would cook his meat if he brought it. And he very apologetically told us, the only place in town that will do it is Le Cirque. I hope that's OK. Um, and I said, it should be just fine. Uh, and so we went, to Le, we went to Le Cirque, and they prepared Bill Koch's beef. And he brought four bottles of red that he knew to be counterfeit from his collection, that had been identified comprehensively as counterfeit. And then he brought four equivalent bottles that he knew to be authentic and we had a blind taste test. And the wine detectives got it wrong. <laughs> so if the wine detectives get it wrong, then Sanjoy, I'm afraid <laughs> you're, you're in trouble, my friend. Just, just stick to cheap plonk so much easier. Here we have, you know, wine fraud, this one individual created, it wasn't even his real name. I mean, you know, when, you, when the story was finally told, it was somebody else and so on and so forth. Then, However, when it comes to banking, and I think many, many people here may be banking with HSBC, and uh, apologies in advance for anything that we may say which will be liable. HSBC, that had to be the most extraordinary story that you've written about, and I'm absolutely astonished that your publishers are happy to go ahead and publish this particular story. So tell me, what legal stuff did you have to do to get this through? both at the New Yorker and now, and then tell us about the story. That, you know, the HSBC story actually legally, well, one, because, because of the kind of writing that I do, um, there are often uh, legal threats. That was certainly the case with this book I just did about the Sacklers. Um, the, uh, there's, there's an expression in, in, in journalism that some of you may be familiar with uh, called the write around. And the idea is that a lot of journalism uh, is driven by access, right? If I wanted to write a profile of Sanjoy, I would come to you and say, can I write a profile of you? And if you said, no, you know, I'm, I'm really not interested in that, um, I'm not going to cooperate, then I would just go away. Um, but occasionally they'll let you do what they call the write around, which is when the central figure in the story won't cooperate with you, and then you just write around them. You talk to their friends, you talk to their colleagues, you talk to people who knew them as children, you talk to their enemies, you talk to their ex-wives, you talk to anybody who will give you insight into them. And a lot of my stories are, are write-arounds, where I'm sort of writing in an adversarial way. And sometimes when that happens, people will threaten you. With HSBC, I think they were so caught up in, in misconduct, to be honest with you, that they... Um, <laughs> when I met with them in Geneva, there was a kind of exhaustion that they had um, because the bank had, had recently been in trouble for, um, for embargo busting and for uh, sort of sanctions busting and for they were, they were the, the money launderer of choice for drug cartels in Mexico. Um, it was a bad time for HSBC. What my story was about, which is actually comparatively benign, was tax evasion and the way in which the Swiss bank, HSBC's Swiss bank, um, had been used for tax evasion and was um, in some ways kind of premised on the idea that you have sort of Swiss neutrality, but what Swiss neutrality meant really was we're neutral and we will allow the French and the English and the Indian and the Brazilian elite uh, to flout their own tax laws by hiding their wealth here in Switzerland. Money has no color. 
Absolutely. And, the, and in this case, what was fun about that story was that the way I learned about it was that I, I, I saw an article about a guy who was described as the Edward Snowden of banking. And he was a guy named Hervé Falciani. He was from Monaco. He, he used to work at the casino in Monaco. And then eventually he worked for HSBC. And he had one day walked out of the bank in Geneva, the private bank, with terabytes of information about private clients and their accounts. And eventually turned this information over to some governments, the government of France. And so I flew, I thought this sounded fascinating and this principled guy who was just trying to blow the whistle on tax evasion. And so I flew to Paris and we met. And this occasionally happens when I'm doing these stories is you develop a nose for the people you talk with. So we sat down. He had a very strange place he wanted to meet. We, he, we met at Place d'Italie uh, at a, a steakhouse for children, which is the kind of thing they only have in Paris. It's called Hippopotamus. And it's, a, it's like a place where you have your child's birthday party, but all the little kids have tiny steak frites. And um, so he's a grown man, but we met there. And um, we started talking, and when he'd been talking for about 20 minutes, I had this sinking feeling because I realized that he was a compulsive liar. Nothing he said added up. I would ask questions and I would sort of press him in the way that you do if you're a journalist and it just, it didn't hold together. And so I, I, we talked for four hours um, and I couldn't make heads or tails of his story and I, I flew back and I said to my editor, I'm so sorry, but I don't think there's a piece here because I can't base my piece on an unreliable narrator. And then about six or eight months later, I, I, went, I sort of revisited it because I thought, what a fun story to build the story around an unreliable narrator. So it turns out, this guy was not the Edward Snowden of banking. He was a thief who thought he would steal this private client data and sell it to other banks, that he would go to other private banks and sell the data. And he got caught. What happened is that the Swiss sort of figured this out. He fled to France. And the French arrested him on a request from the Swiss. But this is just as the financial crisis was taking hold. And so he's under arrest by the French. And they're about to send him back to Switzerland to face the music. And he says to the gendarme, you know, I actually, in this data, there's data about all these French people who haven't paid taxes in France. And there's tens of millions, hundreds of millions of euro that France could be putting in its, back in its coffers. So perhaps you should look at me in a different way. And so the French decided, oh, actually, this guy's not a thief at all. He's a hero of transparency who fled. And so the story kind of goes from there. But it, it, it's a fun example of the way in which um, when you start, you don't know where these stories will take you. And for me, it's the, it's the kind of twists along the way and then he goes off to Barcelona and gets arrested when he gets off the boat there. Yeah, he, I, I never quite figured out why. He was a bit of a ladies' man, and there was a rumor that there was a woman in Barcelona, but he had protection in France. Like, you know, France was not going to extradite him to the Swiss. The Swiss felt that the whole tradition of Swiss banking secrecy hinges on we have to get this guy and punish him because heaven forbid, other people who work at Swiss banks uh, start doing the same. So they're desperate to get him, and the French said, we will protect him no matter what. And then this idiot gets on a boat to Spain. And of course, as soon as he lands in Spain, he's arrested again. Um, he couldn't help himself. But, but then he says to you that that was his idea, that he wanted to be arrested because he didn't want to be <laughs> uh, killed or kidnapped by somebody or the other. Well, no, but this is what I mean about the, him being a compulsive liar and the story not adding up. So he had these fantastical stories. He claimed that he'd been kidnapped on the streets of Geneva uh, by Mossad. Yeah. And there was a Lebanese woman who he had had an affair with and she assisted him in the theft. And he claimed that she was Hezbollah, uh, which she strenuously denied um, and pointed out that she was Christian. Um, he, when he went to Spain, the story that he told me was that he went to Spain because that was the only place he'd be safe. <laughs> because Mexican drug cartels were after him, because he'd given information about HSBC's work with the Mexican drug cartels. And as I was talking to him, I said, well, but 
why would you be safer in Spain than in, Fr than in France from the Mexican drug cartels? And he said, because I'd be in jail. <laughs> and I'm just sort of thinking, what, what, how does that make any sense at all? Um, yeah, he's, he's a bit of a nut, that guy. Uh, there was also 638 Indians who were named in that list of uh, accounts that were taken. Uh, I know we're going to run out of time, and I wanted to ask the audience if there were some questions, but maybe the Prince of Marbella was, was the other fascinating story. Again, a bad guy, you know, who's pretending to be a good guy, who's actually a real baddie. Tell us a little bit about how you discovered him. Yeah, so this is a guy named Monzer al Kassar, who was... Um, for decades, one of the leading uh, international arms smugglers. And he lived in Marbella in the south of Spain. Um, he was originally Syrian, um, but had ended up in Marbella. And he was known by the authorities on, in multiple different countries who had, were trying to pursue him and never succeeded. The, the, his nickname was the Prince of Marbella. And he was a kind of classic um, Cold War creature. He was uh, very involved in Palestinian terrorism, but I should say he was not, he was a kind of a, he was a very pre-9-11 um, uh, facilitator of terrorism in the sense that he was not an ascetic by any means. You know, his family celebrated Christmas. He had big barbecues uh, at his villa. He was lots of fun. He would, he would go out and, and gamble um, in uh, in Marbella at the casino, and the story about him was that he had he had this one check that he would he would use to gamble, and that it was this worn check in his wallet. He always used the same one because it was always returned to him at the end of the night because he never lost. Um, and so he was just this sort of larger than life guy who devised a way of arms smuggling where it would be very difficult to capture him. So he would be. Um, he would have a, uh, a Bulgarian arms manufacturer send arms to a second con country um, while he was in Spain, a third country, and then he would take his payment, say, you know, in, in London or in Switzerland, a fourth country, and it made it really difficult for any of the national authorities to go after him. He, um, he helped supply the weapons that were used in the, the hijacking of the Achille Lauro. Some of you may remember the hijacking of that, uh, of that cruise ship back in the 1980s. And he had really been a target for the, the DEA, the American DEA, ever since, because he'd also been involved in the drug business as a young man. And um, what my story is about is this guy, um, Jimmy Soilis, who's a kind of longtime grizzled DEA agent, who had been pursuing him, I mean, in, in this kind of Ahab-like fashion, pursuing Kassar uh, around the world, just trying to get him for decades. And the way that they ended up doing it um, was, it, it's quite controversial, something that the US does, US law enforcement does, where they, they couldn't get him on anything he'd done in the past because he was just too sophisticated. And so they thought, what if we could set him up with something he did in the future. Um, uh, it's funny, I just, I just watched the, the Ben McIntyre talk. It's a, li a little bit similar in some ways to Operation Mincemeat in the sense that they said, uh, we need to create a sting where we'll create an operation where we'll get him in real time doing something that he shouldn't be doing. And so there were these two guys who um, sought out a former contact of his and said that they were looking to buy weapons for the FARC in Colombia. Um, that they wanted to buy weapons to fight the Americans in Colombia. So it turns out these two guys were both former criminals who had become undercover DEA informants. So they were real criminals, but acting essentially as kind of theatrical versions of themselves while wearing hidden cameras. And the idea was we need to get him to say in real time, yes, I will sell you these weapons on such and such a date, you know, for such and such an amount of money. You can use them to fight the Americans. Um, and so there's this kind of crazy, it's almost that they're putting on a show. You have these DEA agents who are, who ne they needed to kind of cast it right. They have to find the right people to be their informants. And the informants, if you think about it, they're seasoned criminals, but they have to be good enough actors to carry it off. They have to understand the legal technicalities to get him to say the right things into the hidden camera. Um, and uh, so they have to have a kind of sang froid. Uh, 
which they did in the end. And then the real trick becomes, how do we get him in Spain? Because he's so protected by intelligence in Spain, which was his, his home base. So it was a fun one. But the, the Prince of Marbella, I, I, spoiler alert, is now behind bars. And in all of this, you know, we all know that we've got a little bit of bad in us. Some, some of us have got more bad and some have got less bad. But, you know, across the world, you, you see bad sort of flourishing. Is that because the state is not just complicit, but is in essence also primarily bad? Oh, boy. Um, ah. I mean, it, it'll be hard for me to answer that without reference to this last book that I did about the Sackler family. Um, but I certainly came out of that experience concluding that, um, well, a couple of things. I mean, one thing is sometimes, sometimes this, to, to, to borrow an old expression from the Washington Press Corps, sometimes the real scandal is not what's illegal, it's what's legal. Um, and I do think that I think a lot about systems, and I think that the, that the systems of government, and certainly the economic and legal systems, they favor the very resourceful, obviously they favor the elite, uh, but they also favor the crafty, and so whether it's Munzer al Qasar or... Um, or Purdue. Or Purdue Pharma, or there's a, there's a, um, a, a, there's a story in, in Rogues about Stephen A. Cohen, um, who's now known uh, primarily as the owner of the New York Mets, um, but had a hedge fund, a notorious hedge fund called SAC Capital. And SAC Capital was deeply involved in insider trading and everybody knew it. And there were all these people beneath Stephen A. Cohen who ended up getting busted for insider trading. Cohen never did. And it wasn't that the authorities didn't go after him. Preet Bharara, the US attorney in, in New York City, spent years trying to nail Cohen and couldn't. And so I think often it's the case, whether it's Monzer al Qasar or Stephen A. Cohen, um, that you, you find people who get away with it because they, they sort of figure out where the cracks in the system are, they figure out um, how to work the system, how to exert influence to make the system work for them. So I don't know that I would go I don't know that I'm quite ready to say that the, that the system itself is evil, but I think it certainly abets evil in all kinds of ways. I mean, look at the FDA in the empire of pain. On one side, the FDA is trying to shut down uh, uh, Purdue for, for manufacturing OxyContin. And on the other side, the other part of FDA is working knowing that they can do nothing to stop the renewal of the license at the same time. It's absolutely a fascinating story, but that's a different conversation, and you can watch it. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, no, so isn't it, um, to some extent, um, what's culturally acceptable um, at different eras? So, for example, historically, it was normal to smoke. Uh, now you have tobacco companies that sued billions, and, um, someone perhaps working at a tobacco company promoting it is considered evil in a way. It's a form of evil. When oxytocin came out, um, the, the definition of the FDA, I think, in determining whether you give someone something vis-a-vis -vis the side effects is that um, it's the, the benefits of the drug far outweigh the side effects. So that may have been a thought at the time. And I think you mentioned that the Sacklers still believe they were doing good. Um, so is, is it not just um, a cultural thing? And then over time, as, um, as we become a bit more enlightened as people, um, you might find, for example, food companies like you know, the McDonald's of the world serving fast food, contributing to obesity like Pizza Hut or whatever. We know that as an American, a poor American, you ha your only option for food quite often uh, for calories is a pizza or a burger, which are terribly bad for you and contribute obesity and all the other health-related issues that obesity then causes. Um, and, and, and then, of course, you know, they're the oil companies now and the fossil fuel uh, companies. So um, the, the, the question I have is that, uh, is our view on what's evil or good, um, you know, there, there's, no, there's no clear defining line. And I think as, as, as we evolve as a culture, what we consider to be good in the past now becomes evil. Um, and I think that, that, that's the point. I, I, obviously, some of your 
uh, characters were genuinely rogues and, um, you know, they knew they were committing crimes and causing um, uh, misery. But um, I think we're seeing that more and more. And uh, what's your thought on that uh, point that as, as we evolve as a culture and we become more enlightened uh, as, as, a hum as humanity, we start to think that things that were acceptable are now considered evil and um and 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 how how would how how do we treat people who genuinely went about sort of running an oil company um thinking that they were doing good for the world and generating economic output and bringing the world out of poverty or whatever yeah i mean i think it's certainly the case that the i think it's certainly the case that that in some contexts um we evolve, as you say. I think in other cases, there are people who would argue about whether some of this, you know, I mean, so take, I just mentioned insider trading. There are a lot of people who think insider trading shouldn't be a crime or if it should be, it shouldn't be uh, prosecuted in the way that it, that it, that it is. Um, uh, there are people who feel that way about dealing, you know, selling cocaine or, or heroin, right? That, that it's actually the prohibition of these drugs that causes the problem uh, more than it is um, the people who are, who are in the business. I mean, I think, I think the tricky thing for me is that if there's one thing I've come to really believe strongly, it's that um, our, it's funny. So let's go back to the wine thing for a second. There are these interesting studies about wine and the way in which we taste wine, which find that we would like to believe that you're, that there's a kind of, there's a sort of purity to your taste experience of the wine. But in fact, your ability to taste and the, the, the signals that your tongue and your nose are sending to your brain are hijacked by uh, by you know the cognitive parts of your brain that that know this or that right and there's all kinds of studies showing that and in fact to my point about the wine detectives that's more true of people who are more expert right they're actually more likely to um, to have their their everything that they know sort of hijack the sensory experience of tasting I think there's a slightly similar thing that happens with self-interest which is that self-interest can hijack our own personal estimation of what the ethics of what we're doing are. And so, you know, t to take the oil company example, I think, yeah, an oil executive may be regarded differently today than they would have been 30 or 40 years ago. Um, you know, the Sackler name is coming down from all these institutions of, of art in London, and there are a lot of other people saying, okay, well, what about BP? Shouldn't BP be next, right? But there are all kinds of people who work at BP who would tell you, no, that's nonsense. Actually, these climate concerns and what have you are overblown. There's a great deal of hysteria. In fact, we are producing jobs and so forth. Um, Chapo Guzman, I think, probably has a story that he tells about how he grew up in a godforsaken part of Mexico that had been neglected by the state, that by the, by the Mexican state, um, that had suffered because of the United States, that he grew up in a culture in which when you were a child, you went out and you grew poppy in the mountains. You grew cannabis in the mountains and that's, it was an agrarian society and that's what people had done for generations. And if the Americans have this crazy system in which they're obsessed with uh, persecuting people who deal drugs, well, that's really more their problem than it is yours. Now, the problem with that, right, is that Chapo Guzman had bands of assassins beheading people, <laughs> right? I mean, there's, there's no moral universe in which his personal account of his own ethics, I think, can square with what the rest of us might objectively say. But I guess, I guess th th this is the thing. I, so I, I absolutely see your point about how I think standards do evolve. Um, but I have also found that um, whoever the person is, up to and including people who are really murderous, right? People who are kind of, you would think, completely beyond the pale, they often have uh, a story that they tell about how what it is that they do really isn't that bad. And so that would be Swiss bankers, uh, it would be wine counterfeiters, um, and, um, and on down. It would be the Sacklers, and, but I also think it would be the BP executive today. In, in many ways, it's also like the Mahabharata, our epic, where everybody does everything to each other subterfuge, killing, 
uh, you know, sleeping with anything that walks, and it's all fine. Our concept of evil is not necessarily a, this is good or this is bad. But by doing both good and bad, you finally arrive at your own truth at some point of time, which is supposed to be enlightening in some way to you. But till then, go out and do whatever you have to do. And hey, you'll get the consequences. Karma will catch right. up. But, but Hindu philosophy doesn't have a, uh, an idea of hell. We have no hell and we have no sin. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating because, that, because so much of, certainly in the US, right, so much of the culture I think still does have, with its Puritan origins, the notion of sin, um, I mean, as sinful as we can be, <laughs> you know, the, the, the notion of uh, sin and condemnation, I do think, threads through so much of, of the culture. Any other, anybody else, question?